in uh, in September. This September, we're going to have our bicentennial. This is something that uh, I think is probably a little known. That in the territory, uh, the president was the one that actually uh, assigned counties in the in the federal territories of Illinois, and Madison County was created September 18, uh, 1812, along with Edgar County and Johnson County. Uh, we we are one of the oldest counties in the, in the territory. St. Clair County precedes us, and Randolph County was the first. So St. Clair, by the way, is, is named after a general that got beat uh, pretty pretty badly by a, a fellow by the name of Tecumseh. So he's kind of a failed, not too good strategic thinker, but uh, they named uh, St. Clair County after him. We got named after President uh, Madison at the time. So that's... Uh, and, uh, I, I kind of like that. Just comparison between the two counties, that St. Clair County, failed general, Madison County, successful president, founder, or, or, or the uh, author of the Constitution. So, this September we're going to have uh, some events. I think there's going to be a traveling, uh, a traveling uh, totem that actually has a lot about the history of Madison County, and we're going to have several events celebrating our, our bicentennial. I hope to bring you up to date on that. I didn't want to talk about the history of Madison County. I want to talk about history in Madison County uh, because it's so rich. And in fact, as I was putting my slide presentation together, I decided, boy, I better cut this off at the Civil War because if I don't, everybody's going to be leaving to go back to work and I'm still going to be talking and I haven't even made it out of the uh, 19th century. Um, it's just a very pivotal events. Uh, have actually occurred here that have affected uh, the entire country, American history, and, and in the case of Cahokia Mounds, world history. It's a little known, I think, uh, a lot of people don't know, but it's a world heritage site right down in uh, Fairmont City, the, the Cahokia Mounds, Monk's Mound, um, and if you haven't been there, it's really worth a, a Worth the trip. They have a brand new, well, it's not brand new, it's 20 years old, but it's an interpretive center that's really excellent. It talks about the civilization. The, the civilization that was there, this is kind of an amazing thing. In 1100 AD, there were more people that lived here in Madison County in that, in that civilization around uh, Monk's Mound uh, than actually lived in London at the time. It was a major civilization, the Mississippian culture. They don't know what these folks call themselves. They didn't leave written evidence that they could decipher, but they call them Mississippians. Uh, Cahokia actually comes from the Indian term of the Indians that had moved in subsequent to that in, in the 1700s and 1800s. They just fizzled out. After 1100 was, 1100, 1200 was the apex of the civilization, but it uh, uh, started to dwindle down. And by the time settlers came around here, which really started around the uh, 1400s. Uh, the civilization had died out, been replaced by you know, the Indian population that we know of uh, now. But it's worth seeing. Um, Lewis and Clark, you know about Lewis and Clark. Uh, of course, this is the starting point of uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition. We have this great interpretive center that you, if you haven't been there, it's so close, it's just down the street. But, um, they have a reproduction of Camp Dubois. Camp Dubois, by the way, is uh, uh, French of wood. Rive de Bois was the, uh, was the name that the locals had used, the French had used for that area. And that's because the Wood River Creek, as it flowed out into the, into the Mississippi, it had kind of lengthened out and created a big eddy so that all the driftwood that came down the river actually kind of got trapped in that area and would circle around and get trapped. So when they came to that area, there was all this driftwood that's actually backed up on the where the river creek emptied into the into the river. You got two rivers that are emptying out. So lots and lots of wood. Um, perfect place for a winter camp, especially when they're getting there in uh, December of 1803 to set up their camp. You know, it's kind of important to get good dry wood. So it was right there at uh, 
at the River Dubois that they uh, set up their camp. Ate fat, that by all accounts, um, all winter on just the abundance of wild game that was in the area. They, their, their favorite was turkey. I mean, they, they, the reports from the blogs, the journals are that they would bring home wild turkey three or four at night um, for the men. They drilled and fought all uh, drilled and drilled and had target practice and uh, all winter long. And of course, when they fought, they were disciplined in the military manner. So um, it, it really is interesting. They left in 1804, May of 1804, they head up the river. Um, Lewis was uh, in charge. Clark was still in St. Louis and met up with them at St. Charles to take off. So Missouri uh, likes to boast that they were the the departure point, St. Charles likes to boast that they're the departure point of, of, of Lewis and Clark expedition. It was Wood River, Madison County, that, where they started. Um, in Edwardsville, there's a nice, really nice site um, that uh, you, it's fairly new and it's really worth going to see. It's called the Colonel Benjamin Stevenson Home. And it's right there on Vandalia. Right in, kind of just south of, of downtown. And it was built in 1820 by, obviously, Colonel Benjamin Stevenson, who was a contemporary of, of Edwards. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful reproduced, uh, actually, I mean, it, it, it existed from 1820, so they were able to go back and, and, and restore it to the 1820, uh, where they have the everything from the, the craftsmanship that was available at the time in 1820 um, in Edwardsville <coughs> to um, literally the the garden they have out there. So it's, it's they, they're open every, uh, every day during the week and, and it's really worth seeing. Um, of course that's it, is that uh, 1820 is two years past the uh, establishment of Illinois as a as a state. So, you know, Edwardsville was a real center. Vandalia, of course, was our, was our original capital, but <coughs> Edwardsville, and at that point now, Alton were gaining in population and, 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 and getting to have more and more influence in politics. And of course, that was, uh, that was where our first governor was from. Anybody remember who our first governor was? First governor actually was, uh, he was the territorial governor. The first elected governor was Bond, Shadrach Bond. That was one. But when my son was in, in fifth grade, he would say, who was the first governor? And he'd say, Bond, Shadrach Bond. So. And then he would just laugh and laugh, and he was in on the, in on the joke. And so I'll never forget it, but in the 1830s, Madison County was a hotbed. And I'm going to come back and actually talk if we've got time about it, but the thing is, is Illinois was admitted into the Union um, under the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance was, a, was passed by the North in the Congress to saying that new states coming in were going to be free states. So for Illinois to come into the, come into the Union, it required that part of their constitution is that they outlawed slavery in any form of slavery. Um, so Illinois was a free state, but Missouri came in a year later, and it actually was on the outside of the Northwest uh, Northwest uh, Ordinance. And in fact, they created the Missouri Compromise, where it came in and was allowed to be uh, a slave state. So. A lot of a lot of problems among Madison County because right across the river there were slaves. Slaves would leave. They would come across uh, they'd come across to Illinois to try to get away. Illinois, the law was that they they didn't. It wasn't a, a home base. You know, get get to Illinois and you're free. They in a lot of cases they were um, they you know they really could be caught and taken back. So, I mean, there was a lot of, of that going on. Elijah Lovejoy was, in this case, a uh, the first martyr to freedom of the press is what he's known for. And we have the big uh, monument in, in, down in, in Alton that it's really worth seeing. 
Um, but in fact, he started out in Massachusetts, and then he was in St. Louis, where his where his newspaper reported on the issues of abolition, and of course inflamed the citizens. And his press was destroyed many times, and that's what he decided. Hey, you know what? I'm going to get over to Illinois. Maybe I'll have a better place over in Illinois. And that was it. In the, the night uh, uh, of November in 1837, he's over in Illinois. He is shipping in yet another, a, a, yet another press, um, and a mob is chasing him down, hearing that, that yet another one of these presses that were going to put out this newspaper that had all this information about abolitionism. Um, they came. They wanted to destroy the press. He tried to defend himself along with some of his friends. He ended up being shot five times and killed. In fact, they let him, they left his body laying on the ground until the morning. They came out because they were afraid of, uh, uh, they were afraid of, of actually getting killed themselves trying to retrieve the body. But in the meantime, the mob broke into the warehouse where the press was, broke it to pieces and threw, uh, threw it into the river. Um, now here's the thing, the press is, there, there, there's a big piece of the press, and, and you can find it in the lobby of the Alton Telegraph. Um, now, the story I, I had always heard was it was fished out of the river. But in fact, I have a, um, I, I, when I was here the last time, I, should, I shared it with you, but this booklet from the centennial of 1950, and told the actual story of the Sparks Milling Company. In 1915, they were building their new milling company. And what they did was, that digging the foundation, they dug down 18 feet, and they found this big piece of the press. Now, it was thrown into the river, but what happened between 1837 and 1915, the river had shifted courses, it had shifted course, and uh, um, what was river was now land, was now riverfront property uh, where this building uh, was going to be. So they dug it out of 18 feet below, and uh, the Sparks Milling Company mounted it on this big piece of granite, and that's how it was recovered. It wasn't, it was never dredged out of the, the river bottom. It was actually dug out from 18 feet of, of dirt. I, the uh, Lincoln Douglas debate. It was in 1858. 1858 was the last of the whole series. Now this is the thing about the, the Lincoln-Douglas debate that, that gets me. Douglas comes out, and you know, I mean, he's it, he's well known, you know, very well known and very well respected and very well regarded. People came from all over to see this. I mean, they, they came from all over, but he had kind of a cold and he was hoarse from the from his previous speech, but he came out and he spoke. The opening speech was an hour. <clears throat> I mean, can you imagine that? That this crowd is there to hear this, and his opening speech was an hour. And then Lincoln's re re rebuttal was an hour and a half. So we're two and a half hours into this, and they're not done yet, and they're going on. Uh, um, now the nice thing was is that the report finishes up with uh, um, when you know Lincoln was a favorite of the crowd. Now Edwardsville at that time was was Douglas territory. Alton was Lincoln territory, but uh, the crowd was with Lincoln by the end of it. And and of course, I mean this is according to the press account. So you know there was no such thing as a, a real unbiased press at the time. There the press. Press reports were, had their own little bias, but uh, what, what was said is, is that when Lincoln spoke, people changed their mind, and you can see people shaking their heads. But to finish up the finish up the speech, um, Lincoln was reportedly to wave his hands and say, "Well, that's all right. Let him let him go at." It. Now, by the way, one of the things is by the end of the speech, Douglas, who was a Democrat, has resorted to criticizing the Democratic administration of Buchanan, and finishing, and, and so that's the terrible spot that he was in. He, he was trying to, to bolster his own campaign at the same time, draw a distinction between him 
and the Democrat that he was trying to, to follow. So that's why it was kind of comical when Lincoln was waving his hand saying, let him go, you know, just let him go. It's all right. He's doing better than I am. Um, to finish up, I want to tell you about a guy, and, and, and I just wanted to kind of circle back from the speech and from, from that, because what I decided actually was if I went on to the Civil War, if I went on to the era of reform, um, if I went on to the 20th century, I'd be here all, we'd be here all day. But just to kind of tell you about how integral uh, <coughs> Madison County has been to American history, it's more than Lincoln Douglas, it's more than the, the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition, it's more than the Cahokia Mississippian culture that was centered here in, in, in Madison County. They're the second governor, the second governor of, of the state of Illinois was a man by the name of Edward Coles. I mean, he's probably one of the most important, pivotal people in our history that nobody knows about. Um, he was a Virginian. He was a Virginian uh, who <coughs> was a, a friend of Madison's and Monroe's. And uh, in fact, he served Monroe. And he ended up here um, in 1819. But along the way, what happened is, is that he grew up, uh, and he grew up uh, a, a wealthy Virginian, a patrician, and he actually inherited 20 slaves from his family, 20 slaves and their families, <coughs> is what it was said. So when he decided to leave Virginia, he brought those families with him, and on a flatboat, with that flatboat on the Ohio River, on the way to Edwardsville, where he had land holdings, he announced to them that he was setting them free. Um, he had decided in his education that he, uh, during his education, that he was somebody who was against slavery. He, he agreed not to say anything or do anything in Virginia because he didn't, you know, because everybody was afraid in Virginia that setting 20 people free in Virginia would start something big. And so, out of respect for his family, he didn't do that, but he brought them with him on his trip here, but set them free. And after setting them free, he brought them to Edwardsville and gave them each a plot of land um, outside of Edwardsville. Well, that's a pretty noteworthy story all by itself, but that's not where it ends. He decides in 1819 um, to settle in Edwardsville, and by 1822, the Constitution at the time didn't allow the governor to succeed themselves. So he runs for governor. <coughs> He just, he just got there in 1819, more or less, but he runs for governor in, in, in 1822, and he wins by a bare majority. There was actually three, there were three candidates, over four candidates, but the two candidates that were pro-slavery candidates in 1822 actually got a majority of the votes, but he got a plurality of, of the split four ways. And so he was the governor. In his inaugural speech, he made it clear that he was against slavery. Well, now, I told you about this Northwest Ordinance of the original Constitution of the state of Illinois banned slavery. But in effect, as a practical matter, we did have slaves in Illinois. But there was something that was called the Black Laws allowed French settlers who were there prior to um, the white settler, or the white settlers, the, the, the American settlers that were there to, to keep their slaves. There were indentured servants. There was all forms and means of slavery and that is that they could grab people that were there and take them, take them back across the river. So there was, there was in effect a kind of de facto slavery in Illinois. So it was an issue. And in fact, most of the population had come up from Virginia, at the time that we became a state, most of the population had come up from Virginia and Kentucky into the very southern tips of, of, of the state. So a lot of pro-slavery sentiment was out there as evidenced in the, in, in the results of the 1822 election. So they decided to do this, they decided to do this is that they had to have this anti-slavery part of their constitution to become a state. But now there's a state there was a call for a constitutional convention 
to redo the Constitution. Now, in effect, really what they're talking about is when they say pro-constitutional convention, what they actually meant was that they were for slavery. And if they were against the Constitutional Convention, they were against slavery. The legislature was the legislature was was actually created under the conditions of the way it was when the state was created. And most of the population was from the southern counties, of people who were from Virginia and Kentucky. And so the legislature was overwhelmingly pro-slavery. They didn't have a real problem putting this referenda on the ballot to call for a constitutional convention. Now, Edward Coles was the leader of the opposition against this convention. And he waged an 18-month battle against this convention. It was but really something, an epic battle, an epic battle in terms of politics. Now, what happened between 1818 and the state of Illinois becoming a state and 1824, the population of the state had doubled to nearly 72,000 people. But most of the growth, most of the new people who came in were in the central counties that were created, that are created from 1818 and on in the central counties of Illinois. And they're people from New England and German immigrants. So during this epic battle now, one of the things is, is that this is in Edwardsville. And the idea was, let's make the argument that if you're a small farmer or if you're a laborer, slavery is not in your economic interest. If you want to get paid, Slavery actually devalues the, the value of your work as, as if you're not a big slaveholder, that's great for them. But as a regular guy, a regular farmer, a regular laborer, it devalues you. So why would you want slavery in your state? And so they made that argument again in this epic battle over 18 months and finally the election came in 1824. And lo and behold, it was a shock because the pro-convention forces only carried five counties down in extreme southern uh, state of uh, southern Illinois. The rest of the county went three to one, or the rest of the state went three to one against the convention. Now, what happened to Cole? He was actually harassed. Uh, there were brought lawsuits against him, in fact, that, that had to do with uh, a lawsuit that was actually filed in, in Madison County. Uh, that had to do with a law that required you to post bond on any any uh, uh, free man that you brought in, any any ex-slave that you brought into the state. It was a law that was passed well before he was actually even here, and of course, well before he let his slaves go. But uh, he he made the argument that I let him go before I came into the state. They came into the state on their own free will there was a judgment against him. It more or less ruined him. His political career ended with this battle that they won. And then ultimately he left Edwardsville and finished out the rest of his life in Philadelphia. But imagine this, I mean, imagine. If Illinois had had the convention change to law and become a slave state in 1824, I mean, that's one of those moments that you think about this. It's like it changed. It could have changed everything. It was. It could have changed. Where would Abraham Lincoln be? He would be coming from a slave state. Would he have been Abraham Lincoln? Where would Elijah Lovejoy be? Would he have found himself in, in Illinois and become a national cause of, of, of celebrity for? the abolitionist movement in Illinois? No. And what Edward Coles did changed history. And, and it happened right here where we stand today. All right, I'm done. Thank you.